I'm Liz Niesloss. Tonight on Greater Boston, after a year of torrential snow, rain, droughts, and hurricanes, finally some good news on the climate front. I'll talk to an internationally known expert about how far we've come and how far we still have to go. Then a look at explosive revelations that are coming out of Prince Harry's new memoir, Spare, and what they say about the royal family and the rest of us. Usually when we talk about climate change, it's about bad news. From rising temperatures to worsening extreme weather, like the extreme drought turned extreme flood, now plaguing much of the state of California. But now it seems we have some good news. A new United Nations-backed report found that the Earth's ozone layer is on track to recover completely within decades, thanks to ozone-depleting chemicals being phased out across the world. International cooperation has helped alleviate the damage. Joining me to discuss is an international leader on the issue of ozone damage. Susan Solomon is a professor of atmospheric science at MIT and the chair of the university's program in atmospheres, oceans, and climate. Her research was critical to understanding why the ozone hole occurs in Antarctica. Susan Solomon, thank you for joining us. Perhaps we can start with just a very basic reminder to the audience of why a hole in the ozone layer matters. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, the, the ozone layer is absolutely essential to life on Earth. If we didn't have it, we would all be burned to a crisp by the sun's ultraviolet. And I think everyone can appreciate that. If you've ever been sunburned, you know ultraviolet light's bad for your skin, can even give you skin cancer, die. Um, so the ozone layer is critical to keep safe and healthy. So what has happened? Can you explain to us, is this really the end of the problem? What does it mean? Wonderful things have happened. Countries have gotten together and decided to phase out the chemicals that were actually causing the ozone depletion to occur. Those chemicals are called mainly chlorofluorocarbons, and we used to have them in refrigerators and air conditioners and spray cans and all kinds of things. Um, public pressure, particularly actually in the United States, led to the phase out of the chlorofluorocarbons in spray cans in 1978. It took a lot longer to get rid of them in other applications, but we're now in a situation where the whole world, and that includes India, China, everybody, is not producing these chemicals in significant amounts anymore. So that's really good news. What it means is that the ozone layer has slowly started to heal. It takes a long time because these chemicals last in the atmosphere um, some 50 to 100 years after we put them in. So we're going to so remind the audience exactly how much uh, this will mean that the ozone layer will go back to 1980 levels by 2040. For most of the world, uh, the time frame of recovery in the Arctic is a bit longer. It's estimated at 2045 over the Arctic and 2066 over the Antarctic. Is that fast enough to help the damage that's already been done? Oh, it's it's huge because I think the other thing you have to put in context is if we hadn't started phasing out those chemicals, they would have kept increasing at an exponential rate. And, and by now, we actually would have had massive ozone losses all around the world. So things would have been much worse. So we do have some ozone loss, um, and it's going to get better, as you said, slowly. Uh, but but um, eventually, we will have a healed ozone layer. We're already seeing signs of recovery. And that's the best we can do at this point. There's no removing those chemicals once they're already in the atmosphere. So there are other chemicals, though, that are discussed that seem to have taken the place of chlorofluorocarbons, the CFCs, HFCs, which are used in refrigerants. Are there still chemicals we have to worry about? Well, this is actually the incredibly good news about what the uh, protocol on the ozone layer has achieved. The... Uh, uh, compounds that replaced the chlorofluorocarbons are greenhouse gases. So they contribute to climate change. And if we were to keep producing them at the rates that we would expect, 
by 2050, they, they probably would cause something like a third to a half a degree Celsius of extra warming. So almost a full degree Fahrenheit of extra warming. But we've also started phasing them out. And, and that's, that's just amazing. This is the protocol that just keeps on giving, you know, <laughs> solved the ozone hole and now is uh, contributing to combating climate change. But so, so are climate scientists breaking out the champagne, locally sourced, of course, but is that what's happening? Yeah, I mean, basically, I, I, I think that uh, um, we're all quite uh, amazed by the progress that's been made. People, uh, as I said, I think the, the action of the public in, in kickstarting this, uh, this pathway to improvement was critical in this. We had a lot of uh, very um, good cooperation from industry, actually. Uh, they were against it in the beginning, but over time, they adjusted their thinking and, and began to realize that there was much more to be gained by being um, serious about improving the planet. So um, it's, it is really cause for celebration. And yes, uh, we're, we're quite delighted. I think the thing to not be misled by is from year to year, you might hear that we had a colder than normal year in the Antarctic, which would cause increased ozone loss. So it, it'll still go up and down a little bit from one year to another. We might have some volcanoes. They also give you a little bit of extra ozone loss. So, it, it, you know, don't be misled by a blip, I guess. Um, and, but but expect to see things be a lot better. Don't but, take your sunscreen off right now. You know, wait for a few decades. <laughs> but wait for a few decades. People may be a bit confused by this and think that the climate problem is really coming to a close. They may confuse the issues related to the ozone with just issues related to greenhouse gases generally. Can you spell that out? I think there, yes. there will be confusion. Yeah. There, there will be, um, and that's perfectly natural, but the main thing causing our climate to change is our emission of carbon dioxide, mainly from fossil fuel burning and to a lesser extent from deforestation. That is a, a separate problem from the chlorofluorocarbons. So it would have been much worse had we not phased out these extra molecules but, but they are not the primary cause of climate change. What we need to do to solve climate change will be to uh, drastically reduce our emissions of carbon dioxide. So, There's no way around it. So the political will, as you pointed out, around the Montreal Protocol, which was this intergovernmental agreement that came into force in the late 80s, um, there was unusual cohesion and agreement by governments. We just don't have it now on other issues when it comes to tackling climate change, starting within our own country. What are your thoughts on how we can move forward? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think that uh, it's extremely important to acknowledge the different points of view. Um, that was a key part of the negotiations on, in, 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 on the ozone layer, and it is continuing to be a key part of discussions on climate change. Um, but I, I think clearly science alone is never enough. It's always necessary, but it's, it's, it's not enough. The science has advanced in both areas. People have to perceive how their climate is changing. So my advice to people is, you know, go outside and, and actually experience it yourself. Think about whether your summers are hotter than they used to be, whether your nights are hotter than they used to be. They, they almost certainly are all around the world. Um, and obviously, we have massive problems in certain places with heavy rainfall going on right now in California. It's horrendous. That's actually also probably exacerbated by climate change. So we, we really need to start thinking about climate change in the same way we thought about ozone, as a problem for people to engage with and also as a problem for industry to to actually take really seriously. And, and I think that's the hard part. Okay. The, the, yep. the fossil fuel industry has had to be brought to the table. Well, that, that the drag to the table would probably be more, more apt. <laughs> but um, just a very, very quick final question for you. Maura Healy is appointing a climate chief. She's the first governor in a state to do so. Um, you understand the global impact 
uh, of climate change and working with other global leaders. What do you think a governor can do to have an impact more broadly, even outside of Massachusetts? What can one governor's action do? Well, I, I, certainly state regulations play a big role in driving the market. Um, when the state of Massachusetts greatly incentivizes electric vehicles, for example, um, or um, solar power or heat pumps, which we are doing uh, with the help of the federal government in some in some cases, but but not always. We're doing extra on our own, which is great. Um, what that does is to increase the market for those things, and as the market gets bigger, the costs go down, and then other places will, will adopt it as well. Plus, it puts pressure on the industry to all those industries, the vehicle industry, the solar industry, et cetera, to develop more uh, uh, cheap uh, uh, options for consumers. All right. Susan, and, and the more we as consumers do that, the more we promote it. All right. Thank you. Unfortunately, we have to leave it there, Dr. Solomon. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me. Next up, we've heard a lot lately from the Duke of Sussex, formerly known as Prince Harry, and his wife, Meghan Markle. There have been plenty of revelations by the pair since their exit from the British royal family. An Oprah interview, a podcast, and recently, the Netflix docuseries aptly called Harry and Meghan. It's really hard to look back on it now and go, what on earth happened? You know, there's leaking, but there's also planting of stories. There was a war against Meghan to suit other people's agendas. It's about hatred. It's about race. It's a dirty game. The pain and suffering of women marrying into this institution, this feeding frenzy. I realized they're never going to protect you. Now, there's more. Harry's long-awaited new memoir, Spare. As in, there's an heir, William, and a spare, Harry. Certainly plenty of fodder for those interested in the royals, but there's more to it. Joining me now, Boston Globe columnist Renee Graham, who argues that there's some universality to Harry and Meghan's story, writing in her latest column, when it comes to Britain's royal family, many seem to forget that the operative word there isn't royal, it's family. And also joining me in the conversation, Netta Tofik is the North American correspondent for the BBC. She has covered the royal visit to the U.S. And I'm told that, Netta, you were in a New York bookstore when Spare came out. Netta, what kind of reaction were you seeing? Yeah, well, I think there's a very different reaction in the United States uh, to Prince Harry and his decision to come out with what he calls his side of the story compared to the reaction that we've seen in the UK. Of course, in the UK, it's their royal family. It's the oldest institution there. Uh, so there is a slightly different connection. Americans here look at the royal family uh, more from the angle of the fact that there is no royal family here. They're seen a bit as celebrities. There's interest in the intrigue and the family dynamics. And when I spoke to readers, I mean, it was interesting to see that they didn't just reflect on the revelations and leaks that have come out in the last few days, but they've really spoken and about their, uh, I've really noticed the divides between those who say, actually, perhaps he should have kept some of these details private. They are ultimately a family who deserve to not have their business aired out in public uh, compared to those who say, look, I think uh, he has every right to tell his story given he feels he didn't have the opportunity to do that uh, back in his home country, given his allegations that uh, leaks would often hide his perspective um, and that other members of his family would uh, allegedly leak against him. So there was a divide amongst readers here in the U.S., I think, as well. Right. And Renee, you're very much in the camp of this is family news, family stories that have to be shared, that should be shared. Can you explain that? Absolutely. You know, it's it's the idea that I don't understand why people are upset that he wants to talk about his family, because what happens in his family is also his story. And the idea that somehow he should continue to hold these secrets when there's already so much out there about the royal family. And usually, 
people like Harry don't get to tell their own story, I think it's important. I also think it's interesting that in a lot of the things he's talked about that have been highlighted in some of his interviews, where he's talking about, you know, not liking Camilla, his stepmother, the woman who had long had an affair with his father when his father was married to his mother, Princess Diana, or that he and his brother William, you know, aren't getting along and have had physical fights. That's family. That's the way these things work. And I think there's a kind of sense that people have that family is this infallible unit and you take what is dealt to you. And there's something really refreshing by the fact that he's saying, no, I'm going to talk about my family, what it's done to me, how I fit into all of this and what it means in a much broader sense for the life he wants to live with his wife and children. So certainly, though, Renee, we already knew they were human. I mean, since Charles and Diana, the intimate phone calls of Charles professing love in his very particular way to Camilla and toes sucking and serious incidents with uh, Prince Andrew, very serious allegations of sexual abuse of a minor. I mean, we really know they are more than, they are very human with all the frailties. So is there still merit though to sharing this kind of family insight? Well, you know, everything you just said is true, but this is also a family known as the firm. They're a business, they're an institution. And so there's something just bigger than these blood ties that they have. And, you know, something I constantly go back to, and I remember watching all the coverage around Princess Diana's death and the way that they fed those boys to the media and had them out there kind of working the crowd like they were politicians. Yeah. And there was something even then so unseemly to it that I even felt then it bordered on child abuse. They were mourning their mother but there was an image that the royal family needed to present, especially because people felt that the family had not done enough to acknowledge right. Diana's death and what that meant to the public. To show emotion. It was to show their emotion. That was a very interesting point that you made. Um, Nitta, do you think that shows the impossible position of the royal family? I mean, the children paraded to show their emotions in order to connect with the public. Um, to make a point there, or is that just bad judgment? Well, look, I think if we look at what Prince Harry himself has tried to explain, there is a hierarchy uh, to the monarchy that is very well understood by the British public. They are public servants. Uh, they are there to uh, share those moments to be more relatable uh, to people in the UK. And so certainly I think one part of his story has been the pain, the fact that he was able, never able to grieve the death of his mother. And clearly throughout this memoir, you see how that affected him throughout his life. But I don't think people in the UK who are critical of this account will take issue with that. I think what people are taking issue with is, is perhaps some of the bigger points that he is trying to make with this memoir. So uh, attacking the way that the palace uh, interacts with the, the British press, the British press uh, itself, in fact. Um, and I think he's also brought up key questions about colonialism and race. And so this is why we're seeing such a heated response to the memoir, to the Netflix documentary, because of all of the issues that it's forcing many people in the UK uh, to confront. And I think what's really interesting as well is the fact that those key points of his may have been getting lost a bit uh, with the emotions that we're, we're seeing coming out about these revelations. Well, it seems he certainly wants to make points about racism and British society. Renee, Harry said in a recent ITV interview that he did not call the royal family racist in an o Oprah interview where Meghan Markle essentially said uh, some of the royal circle fretted over the color of the baby's skin. Um, but Harry pointedly said in his ITV interview, the press were the ones who called it racism and he took pains to call it unconscious bias that can be remedied. Is that making a distinction without a difference when it comes to his treatment? You know, I think whether the bias was conscious or unconscious, it was racist. If you're sitting around asking how dark a child will be because the mother is biracial, that's racist. You know, now now Harry can parse that any way he pleases, you know, and sure. But I, I, I think he now is trying to back off that a little bit because that became 
what the media focused on, that he had called the, fa the family racist. And then people were asking the family, are you racist? And William said, we're very much not a racist family, which is a really funny term. But I, I just think that he's trying to make it not just about the family, but about broader British society as well, and especially you know, parts of the media, the tabloid media, and how they latched on to things like calling Megan almost straight out of Compton. If that's not racist, see, that's not unconscious bias. That's racist. And I don't make a great distinction between that and someone, some unnamed person in the royal family asking, you know, wondering how dark Archie would be. And you also had a horrific uh, column in The Sun by Jeremy Clarkson saying he hated Megan on a cellular level. Um, many people wonder, Netta, is there a fundamental racism in British media? Yeah, you know, Liz, that has been the, the question now that I think many people in the United, uh, in the UK are, are having to confront. I mean, I was in Boston during Will and Kate's first visit to the United States in many years when that controversy erupted over Lady Hussey, uh, the racism Rome, Buckingham Palace, or her, you know, asking uh, Ms. Filani about where she was really from. Uh, and we saw the Buckingham Palace, which has been silent throughout uh, all of these revelations from Prince Harry's memory. Memoir. They haven't commented publicly. Uh, they put out a statement right away because they understood the seriousness uh, of that situation. I think Buckingham Palace realizes. Uh, so it, it, it has been something that they have had to confront. Uh, I think there was this desire uh, in the beginning uh, amongst the public uh, to be able to see that Meghan was representing a modern new face, um, bringing more representation and diversity, obviously, into the royal family, and many saw what has happened as an opportunity missed, um, that they could have been a real asset uh, to the royal family. That certainly hasn't played out that way. Now, people are divided about who is at fault for that um, in the UK, and that has certainly been uh, part of this larger discussion. But when I was in Boston, it was really interesting to see uh, how all of the timing of this played out, because this is coming after uh, the death of Queen Elizabeth, so at a time when there's a lot of um, uh, more positivity toward the monarchy, obviously, and, and her years of service. And, and it came during that visit with Will and Kate. So the timing of all of this is also something that's been notable. Renee, do you think that uh, a lot of the important points, maybe, of this book, uh, the, the dysfunction of the royal family, about issues of racism, all of that, are they going to get lost in all the salacious details that have been revealed about frostbite on nether regions and the first time he had sex and all that sort of stuff? I mean, it almost seems like they are becoming the royal Kardashians. Does that, is that a missed opportunity to bring out a deeper message? The book could talk about racism on every single page and people will find a reason to avoid talking about race. That's just the way things are. And I think not just in British society, society, certainly in American society as well. These are subjects that people do not want to discuss, which is why nothing ever gets better. You have an opportunity to have these conversations and to go deep, to really get under the hood of what's going on in these societies and in these institutions. And nobody wants to talk about it because it makes them so uncomfortable. So yeah, it's great to talk about the frostbite to talk about what happened at Courtney Cox's house. But we know that's not what this is about. And none of this can get around the fact of the way Megan was treated, the way Harry has felt, the way he has admitted he didn't see bigotry before until he got married to this racial woman and saw it in this much clearer way. But that's a conversation lots of people don't want to have. So it's easier just to say, you know, well, Harry's changed and this woman is terrible. And to say the things that Jeremy Clarkson said and think about the depth of what he said, you know, that he hates her on a cellular level. Why? Well, what we, yeah. The conversation, you know, that's the thing. Yeah, that conversation may be moved a little further along. Uh, Meghan Markle reportedly has her own memoir coming out. Uh, unfortunately, we have to leave it there. Renee Graham, Netta Tofik, thank you very much.
We've talked a lot over the last few weeks about government transitions, and today marked the 225th anniversary of a rather unique transfer here in Massachusetts, that of the Sacred Cod. Led by the group Revolutionary Spaces, the event is just as unusual as it sounds, traveling to the dulcet tones of the fife and drum from the old state house to the current one. Adam Riley has more. To get a sense of why a bunch of people dressed in weird costumes just carried a big wooden fish through downtown Boston, you've got to go back centuries, maybe to 1602, when Englishman Bartholomew Gosnold arrived in what's now Provincetown and named the whole peninsula Cape Cod because the water was teeming with the fish. Or to the Revolutionary War, which was partly stoked by Britain's hostility to the booming New England fishing industry. Or to 1784, when this guy, State Rep. John Rowe, suggested hanging a brand new cod at the old state house to replace another one that disappeared during the war, as, quote, a memorial of the importance of the cod fishery to the welfare of this commonwealth. Of course, all that explains the statute, but what about the people carrying it? We heard people chanting, cod fish, cod fish. You they probably it? found themselves wondering, why am I doing this, and why is a cod parading through downtown Boston? <laughs> Do you have any idea what's going on here? No. Follow the cod. <laughs> it's a state house thing. Okay. Commemorating the old state house moving out to the new state oh, house. Oh, okay. The new no, state I... house on the hill? Yep. It's been there forever. New, relatively speaking. <laughs> I never thought I was going to be marching with a wooden cod today. Yeah. So Life comes at you fast. Now, if you're starting the new year on a grumpy note, or you had to wait while the fish walkers did their thing, you might be rolling your eyes at this point. But this transfer of the so-called sacred cod from the old state house to the new one was a pretty impressive ritual on a few levels. For one thing, it was a throwback to a similar march that happened 225 years ago when the seat of Massachusetts government shifted, making it a reminder of how rich Massachusetts history really is. Also, the cod itself is a survivor. Back in 1933, those crazy kids at the Harvard Lampoon stole the fish, but then gave it back. And if you let yourself get into the proceedings, the staging was actually pretty impressive. I just happened upon it and I was curious. I just love our history here and how we've preserved it for so many years and all these young people are here to celebrate it. We wanted to showcase the connection between the two institutions, um, the old state house and the new state house. For the participants, it was an opportunity to feel the power of history that connects us to that important moment in our shared past. Plus, the COD's journey was quick, less than 15 minutes from point A to point B. This time, after they delivered the goods, the marchers got together for some light refreshment and reflection on a job well done. From your vantage point as the bearer of the cod, how did the march go? I thought it went fantastic. I couldn't see what was going on, but everyone got here uh, with me and the cod, so I think we, uh, we nailed it. With all eyes on you, were there ever moments where the cod was shaky, where you stumbled and almost dropped the cod, were worried that there'd be an incident with the cod? Yeah, there was an incident on School Street where I wasn't totally sure I was going to be able to maintain balance. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's not an even road, uh, but I was able to stabilize, get the cod where it needed to go. Government can continue in Massachusetts. For the record, that good-looking fish isn't actually the sacred cod that hangs in the House of Representatives, but a look-alike facsimile. The first sacred cod was lost in a fire, the second went missing during the Revolutionary War, and the third sacred cod is deemed too precious to leave the building. Outside the State House, I'm Adam Riley for GBH News. That's it for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow. Thanks for watching, and good night. How about